She's passionate about telling stories of amazing women who are rocking the world and empowering women to live, love, and thrive. Here's your host, Katherine Gray. Hi, welcome to Live, Love, Thrive. So happy to have you with us here today. As you know, we're always about empowering women. And today I have on a special guest. We have a male guest who is all about empowering women. He does many uh, female-driven uh, character movies for Lifetime. Please give a warm welcome to director and producer Michael Pfeiffer. Hi, Michael. How Thanks are you? Good, good. Thanks good. for having me. I'm so happy Appreciate to it. have you. Um, you know, it's rare that we have a gentleman on the set, so <laughs> we're honored to have you because I know you're all about empowering women to uh, get into production and, and helping them to move up, and we're going to talk about that and good. talk about some of your movies. I know you have uh, directed, you told me, 63 movies and produced over 100 movies. I have. I have been doing yeah, this for boy, you're really over slacking. 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it wasn't last week, huh? Uh, but five five movies this year alone. Yeah, and I'm preparing to do a Western next. Oh, my gosh. And a Christmas movie in New Jersey and New York in December. So right. hopefully we'll hit seven this year. And a lot of the movies uh, you're doing are on Lifetime. A lot of them, yes. And uh, I know you also just mentioned you have one coming out on Netflix. On Netflix, one just yeah. just appeared on Netflix last week, called Deviant Love, and uh, I have a movie on uh, December twenty first on Ion Channel called Twelve Pups of Christmas. I love it. You know, I think people always enjoy hearing how people got into the business because you know there are so many writers, directors, producers out there wanting to know how to break in, and yeah. they want to hear your story. Um, now you kind of had a leg up because your dad was in the business. Uh, you had shared with me that he was the head of research for 20th Century television Fox yeah. television yeah. Uh, in New York. Mm -hmm. So you were born in New York. You're a, you're a Bronx boy, right? Uh, Brooklyn. Oh, Brooklyn. In, yeah, Brooklyn. Yeah. Oh, uh, whoops. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Big faux pas. <laughs> uh, no, I, mean, yeah, I, I was born in Brooklyn and, yeah. in 1972. Yeah. 20th Century Fox moved everybody out to Los Angeles. Ah. So we moved out to Los Angeles to 20th Century Fox. Um, but um, um, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley. Yeah. And um, what the, the interesting thing I find about, about how I got into business, I hadn't, even though my father worked for 20th Century Fox, my father then w went on to work for Carol Burnett. Uh, I liked to, went to elementary school, a lot of famous kids, J.J. Um, uh, Abrams, uh, Ed Asner's kids, oh uh, O.J. Simpson's kids, the Richards girls. But um, uh, my parents then divorced and I went off to a, a uh, we moved, and I actually moved across the street from the editor of Variety, actually. His oh. name was Tom Pryor. And... Um, you know, here I am living across the street from the editor of Variety, but uh, I still had no interest in making movies. I grew up doing photography and sculpting and drawing. My brother and I drew all the time. We'd have drawing competitions. And, and I was you very- you thought you wanted to be an architect, right? Well, I, I went to school for architecture. Yeah. I went yeah. to the University of Colorado at Boulder for architecture. And uh, so my father was, had worked at Fox and then Carol Burnett and that ended. <clears throat> and he, um, he started making his own low budget movies. And still it just didn't dawn on me to make movies. It just right. wasn't a part of, you know, yeah. But that's a lot of my father didn't really involve us in that world. Right. And uh, were you, now, um, were you living with him or your mom? We or? were uh, living with my mom. So my, it was oh, my so mom you, with three kids. Right. And my father lived in Redondo Beach, which some of your viewers know, but it's right. it's about 45 minutes away. So we right. saw my father every other weekend and Wednesday nights. Yeah. You know, but we didn't really spend much time in his office or really, I mean, I think in that day and age too, yeah. men didn't really take kids to their work as much and didn't right. really express what they did as yeah, much. It's a different culture. It is. Yeah. Cause now me with my son, yeah. I mean, uh, my son is on my sets. He operates camera for me when he can. Now he's focused on college and everything and, and his sports, but, um, but he operates camera for yeah. me. So, so I went to school for architecture. Right. <clears throat> I graduated architecture school and I was going to, I was took a year to work at a design firm. Yeah. I got a job at a small design firm designing kitchens and furniture, <clears throat> all this crazy stuff. And uh, a tour cabinet. We designed a tour cabinet once. Uh, I designed a metal <laughs> stair railing that in a house in Santa Monica. Yeah. Um, but not quite what you had in mind. Well, you know, yeah. you go to architecture school. Architecture yeah. school doesn't teach you how to be an architect. It teaches yeah. you how to be a, vis a vision, a visionary. Right. Right. You know? Which actually probably end up helping you as a director. Without a doubt, hundred percent. Right. right. I mean, I think directing is the. I mean, I think architecture school yeah. is the best education for directing movies. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, so, remember that. Yeah. Um, so back to your dad for a second, because he was very instrumental in syndicating the uh, Carol Burnett show. Yeah. And I and I don't want to pass over that because Carol Burnett uh, 
was so groundbreaking as the first woman variety show. Right. And I'd actually seen a piece on this about how they did not want to have a female driven variety show. They never thought it would work, right. you know, how women aren't funny and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And even though Lucy yeah, Ball was, yeah, you know, right. legendary at still at that point. Right. right. Yeah. But I don't think she'd ever had a variety show. Right, right. Right. So this was variety show. But Luckily, Carol's agent had written into her contract that they had promised that she would have this variety show. Mm -hmm. And so the long and the short of it is they honored that, and here it ends up being like this huge sensation. And then your dad was very instrumental in syndicating that around the world. He, so he, that's amazing. He was. In fact, I talked to him just the other We had dinner the other day. He's, he's going to be 87 in October, but he's he still remembers everything. He's got all his faculties. Unbelievable. But he... Um, <coughs> he um, he said, I asked him, I said, did you actually come up with this idea? Which the idea was an hour long television show. It was really 44 minutes and then you have commercials. So his idea was to take the 44 minutes and cut it down to 22 minutes mm -hmm. and then syndicate it all over the world. Yeah. And so he had come up with this idea. Maybe other people had come up with it. I don't know. But he knew somebody who then knew Carol. And sort of from one step to another, it all came together. Wow. And that other person went to Carol and she opened up the office. It was called CB Distribution, Carol Burnett Distribution. And they did something like $50 million in sales in the 70s on that show. Oh, my show. God. Like, yeah. <clears throat> so right. Today, that would be like a billion dollars. Uh, it's something. a lot of money. Something yeah. like that. <laughs> well, maybe even bigger now because just television and yeah. content is bigger. Right, yeah. Um, and her show is still selling all over the world. I mean, you can still her turn the TV and see Carol. You know, Burnett. I just, it's so funny that you say this. I just happened to watch it the other day, and it's still funny as ever. I mean, oh. it's timeless. timeless. It's timeless. Yes. She's amazing. Yes. She's a genius. So, you know, since we're all about, you know, women trailblazers, I love to talk about her. And I'm so happy that your dad really was instrumental in, in making that a, a, a global sensation. Yeah, but I don't want to yeah. take anything away from her. I mean, yeah. I don't know exactly how yeah. it all came about, but well, I do know that sometimes yeah. it's just a matter of networking. One person knows somebody, oh, totally. then somebody, and yeah. then before you know it, it, it all, all comes fell to into place. Yeah. 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 Uh, so for you, uh, so then slowly but surely you started working on your dad's. Uh, so I, I, I was going to go get my master's films. degree in architecture. Yeah. And my dad was making some silly film. He made some really silly genre VHS films back in the day. Yeah. And my brother was in between Berkeley and Harvard. Yeah. And we'd say, you know the film. millennials are going VHS. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> I had I, my my son. I would joke about how millennials don't know what a blockbuster is. Now, yeah. You yeah, know. Yeah. That, and because you don't have to wait in line for movies anymore, yeah, you just yeah. go pick your seats. <laughs> but um, so uh, uh, my brother said, well, let's go work on this movie yeah. that dad's doing. And we worked on it and it was a mess. It, it was, was a complete disaster. And uh, there was a woman directing that movie too, actually. And I, she was wow, having a hard time. that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. And, but the line, the producers of it were just disorganized and things were falling apart. My brother well, that was and I- the men. No, exactly. No, I'm just kidding. Well, that's my point. <laughs> and, and they ended up, uh, uh, my brother and I ended up sort of being the glue to yeah. help her <clears throat> to get this movie done. Do you remember the name of it? Yeah, it's called Fraternity Demon. <laughs> <laughs> you were hoping I wouldn't ask, right? <laughs> and you can find it on the internet. <laughs> but but uh, so was it fun or what, like what made you then get into the business? You well, must have found some thrill with it. Of course, I yeah, mean making sure. movies. So yeah. so you know, growing up, I wanted to be the you know I wanted to be Steve Garvey, the first baseman of the Dodgers. You yeah. know, and that dream ended a long time ago. <laughs> but to me, the next best thing of being an athlete or being is 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 for me actually is making movies. Yeah. I I mean there's just there's 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 a lot to making movies that I find fascinating that I love and I think a lot of people obviously yeah. love because it's yes. movies are a part of our culture, you know, yes. people don't you know, if you're an engineer, they're not calling you up left and right and going on radio shows to be an engineer. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. movies is another thing. But movies are, you know, there's just something magnetic about it. So, of course I got the bug working on the one movie. My brother then went off to Harvard. Yeah. I didn't go to get my master's degree in architecture. I kept working for my father. So I started producing movies for him. I started uh, running his video label. Mm -hmm. I started uh, going with him to the film markets around the world, to Cannes and Milan, selling his movies. And I got a really good global pers global perspective on films and, and really the independent, commercial right. independent film world, right. which is different than the independent world. It's different than the right. studio world. And you know yeah. what? I feel like as a director and producer, <clears throat> That was invaluable for you to learn that 100%. international distribution mm -hmm. that probably most directors and producers don't know. Right. That, so that was well. Invaluable. It's invaluable because you learn. I learned at a young age that movies that make money generally are genre films, or you have to find what people want to watch. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to say Picasso created art for himself. He didn't care if other people liked it. 
course, Picasso, but there's plenty of artists out there that create right. their own art, and they, it's very, they struggle making a living. It's hard to sell art that's for yourself. But filmmaking is commercial design. You're making a product for the masses. I mean, Steven Spielberg, to me, is the greatest commercial designer right. ever. Right. He knows how to make a, a movie that the masses are going to be attracted to. So there's certain, to me, there's certain attraction of making a product mm -hmm. for people but but when you're in the business you really need to find certain niches right. that people actually want to watch right. or companies want to buy and yours seem to be female driven characters well, which is uh, you know and there aren't a lot of if you do the research oh, your uh, <laughs> Gina uh, Davis Institute shows the research that there's uh, the majority of movies do not have uh, female driven characters um, of course, I'd like to see the them majority be more of studio films. Yes, right. It's a very interesting thing because yeah. actually, in the TV world, Hallmark is making them, Ion Channel makes them, Lifetime, they're all female driven. But for some reason, the studio world uh, still so hasn't connected to that yeah. or recognized. I mean, you know, there was years with the, the the Ashley Judds and Julia Roberts and, you know, and uh, the, uh, for instance, if you take Ashley Judd movies or Sleeping with the Enemy of Julia Roberts, I mean, these movies are are studio movies that Lifetime basically mimicked the whole concept just yeah. on lower budgets. Right, right. Um, so they're out there. Yeah. You know? um, I always tell people, though, with independent films is that, that, that uh, a lot of people want to make independent films that are going to make, it's the, the Picasso, the artist thing. You know, uh, an right. independent film about a priest who discovers this. And, and it's, it's really interesting to them, but not everybody else. Oh, gotcha. So you, you kind know? of have gotten into that niche of, what's popular to the masses, and that's why it's worked right. for you. I mean, I make a lot of Christmas yeah. dog movies, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and, and a lot of the movies I, I make... I have I'm, some pictures of you on the set yeah. with the dogs. With the puppies. And, uh, and with the girls and, and different, you know, uh, films that you've uh, produced and directed. Of all the films you've done, 63, not to put you on the spot, but is there one favorite? Well... There's one most important film to me in my life that I did not direct. Okay. And there's probably one film out there that's my favorite that I directed. So the, the film that's most important to me in my life is a movie called Choosing Matthias. And Choose Matthias, um, uh, I, I had made this strange horror film with a friend of mine named Corbin Timbrook. And, and Corbin uh, was in a short film directed by Bo Hopkins. Bo Hopkins is an old-time actor who was in westerns and soap operas and things for years. And Corbin was starring opposite a woman named Kaya Coley. And, uh, and Kaya Coley wanted to make a movie called Choose a Matthias, and she was going to star in it. And uh, she asked Corbin and Bo, do you know any line producers? Uh, a line producer is what I used to do. A line producer fabricates the movie. If you go to build a house, the yeah. contractor builds the house for you. Right. So you, when you make a movie, you find a line producer to, right. to put all the nuts and bolts together. So I know where said, this is going. <laughs> right. So she said, she said, do you know a line producer? Well... I get this phone call randomly from this woman saying, uh, I hear you're a line producer. I want to make a movie. Can we meet? And we met. And this meeting went very well. And, it sure uh, <laughs> did. <laughs> and, and in a very short amount of time, she, she hired me to, she and her sister Tamara hired me to produce the movie. And, um, and Kaya ended up directing the movie also and starring in it opposite Jeff Fahey. And uh, we made this movie together. We fell in love location scouting. Um, and in only six months, we went from our first kiss to getting married. I love it. That, and, that, uh, that would be my favorite movie if I was you too. It's the most important. And, you know, the, the film to that movie, we shot that movie on 35 millimeter. But back then you did finish lower budget movies. You didn't yeah. finish on 35. You finished yeah. on, on beta. Yeah. And uh, on beta cam. The film is actually sitting in our garage right now. But, oh, really? Uh, yeah. But we've been married for eight, 18 and a half years. I love that story. We have a 17-year-old son. So you fell in love on a movie set. Perfect for a producer, director. Yeah. And I love that you're a woman. Uh, your, excuse me, your wife, uh, your woman, <laughs> your, I'm her man, your, she's my woman. your wife, <laughs> uh, wrote, directed, and starred in that movie. Yeah, well, right? she didn't originally write the script. There are a few other writers, but every night she and I, and this is where the falling in love and knowing you can work together, we yeah. would shoot for 12 hours and then come home and rewrite the script, be right. ready for the next day. And like you, you know? said, working on a script, uh, excuse me, on a movie set with somebody is not easy. No. And the fact that it was easy made you guys know, oh, this is a great fit. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you're going to war with somebody yeah. and you're in the trenches and you're getting along really well yeah. and there's all this That's stuff special. going around you and there's yeah. bombs going off everywhere and yet you two connect. Yeah. 
That's um, amazing. And so I knew, yeah. I just knew that that, yeah. would, that would be, a, and it just happened. Yeah. And I said to you that, that I actually didn't propose to my wife until the rehearsal dinner. Yeah. Because we were just, the, the train had left the station, we were getting married. Yeah, so, yeah, it happened that fast. Yeah. Uh, but I love, so you must be drawn to uh, powerful women. I mean, for her to be producing and, and uh, directing and, and starring in her own movie. I mean, that took some chutzpah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it sure did, and, yeah. and I give her a lot of credit for it. And she also, um, um, I mean, just taking on, it's, it's just the weight of the world on your shoulders uh, yeah. when you're making a movie like that. Yeah. And, and it's a beautiful film. And, yeah. uh, and it played, uh, I think uh, Lifetime bought it domestically and Hallmark bought it for foreign. So it played for years and oh, years wow. on TV. One of these just recurring things. Yeah. But it was shot, we, sh we shot it in 35 and finished it in a 4-3 format. Now mm -hmm. everything's finished in a 16 by 9 format. Mm -hmm. So the movie can't be redistributed right now right. until we take that 35 millimeter film mm -hmm. and, and reformat it for 2K, 4K, high def, whatever. Was that the first movie that you did for Lifetime? Well, um, it's the first movie that I made that sold to Lifetime. Right. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so th then did, and then you realized that that was maybe a niche for you? Well, an interesting thing about what I do is I actually don't really make movies for Lifetime. I make movies for other companies who then sell the movies to Lifetime. Oh, gotcha. You know, so Lifetime doesn't hire me directly. These other companies hire me. Oh, got it. You know? So the production company hires you and says, we want you the to The distribution company oh. hires my production company oh, gotcha. to write, produce, and direct them. Uh -huh. Sometimes they hire me to write them just out of, you know, yeah. just a spec script. And sometimes I'm given a script and I rewrite it and have to direct it and produce it. Right. So you, you know? did tell me, and I know you probably don't want me to announce it, but you have you have taken in scripts and read them and, and ended up producing them. Now he's going to kill me. Well, the thing <laughs> Right is, on camera. He's killing well, me. <laughs> listen, and you, I, I, I think everybody in Los Angeles has this problem. Everybody's got a script yes. and everybody wants somebody to read the script. Right, right. It's very time consuming to read scripts. Absolutely. Another thing though, when someone gives me a script, I tell them, I will not, and this is I think for everybody out there, if somebody gives okay. you a script to read, tell them that you will not read the script unless they're willing to take constructive criticism. Okay? Right, right. I, there's nothing worse to me than people read a script and they just sugarcoat it and it's great, whatever. There's right, no point right, anyways. What's right, the point right, of giving somebody right. a script to read? So yeah. when you take in a script from somebody, say, I will read it. I might not get to it for a year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when I do get to it, I'm only gonna right. I'm only gonna give you constructive right. criticism. Right. You know, and you can take it or leave it, but it's just my personal opinion. There are so many scripts out there, yes. so many script writers. What makes a good script? I can I can uh well, there's various things, but not deviating from, um, um, not deviating from what works. Okay, yes. so I like to quote often this book by uh, an author named Christopher Vogler called "The Writer's Journey." Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. everything harkens back to writer's mythol to, to the Greek mythology. Wait, okay. and it's called "The Writer's Journey." The Writer's Journey, Christopher Vogler. Okay, um, everything harkens back to Greek mythology. All these stories, ev really? every story really that works is the hero story and it's about someone who exists in the in their you you meet them in their ordinary world and then they break out of their ordinary world and they go to the extraordinary world okay oh. so you care about them when you meet them in their ordinary world and then uh and then once they go in the extraordinary world you care about them even more right and so you're willing to take this ride with them so you can look at apocalypse now you can look at star wars you can look at the godfather you can look at gone with the wind right the, the most simple one is wizard of oz Right. You know, uh, uh, she's in Kansas, yeah, and she goes to the extraordinary world, right. okay, in Oz. And um, it's critical, I think, to you don't have to you can deviate from that a little bit, but I really think good scripts actually follow that structure. Wow, you follow that's the structure, so that's already a leg up, I think. Yeah, follow that structure. So if you look at a movie like Dunkirk, okay, uh, um, Christopher Nolan is one of my favorite filmmakers, uh, but to me, Dunkirk didn't work. Okay. Yeah. It's beautifully made. It's a big budget movie. It's it's about war. It's 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 got a, a weight to it, but it right. doesn't work, I think. The reason I think it doesn't work is because he tried to do something different and deviate from the structure, from the right. mythology, and right. it's it's all out of order. Right. And I think it's out of order and the, you lose your audience. You know, uh funny that you just said this cuz I'm thinking of a movie I just really enjoyed, Blinded by the Light. Yeah. And it's exactly what you just said. It's it is. an ordinary person being taken to an extraordinary place right. and you feel connected to him and you feel that joy of Right. No, it doesn't yeah. have to be an ordinary person yeah. either. Yeah. It could be a special person. Right. 
but it's their their ordinary world is just their world. Right. right. They could be the president I, of the United States. Yeah, sure. You know, and their world Please is special. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, yeah. and 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 then and then and then where does it yeah. take that person? Right. But you got to get to know the person. Right. I you know, like I think that. a good one. Uh, what's the movie with Michael Douglas where uh, he falls in love with Annette Bening and he's the president of the United States? You know, you get yes. to know him and what kind of person he is. And right. Annette Bening, he meets her and she changes him. And yes. then you're along for this ride. Right. So stick to that with your scripts, right? right. Stick to that, right? Yeah. Don't deviate from the plan. That makes a lot of sense. Another movie that deviated from those Christopher Nolan movies is Memento. But that's just the movie backwards. Right. That's the whole thing just backwards. Right, you know? right, yes. Um, so and so I think that's important And what was the other favorite writers. one of yours that you said you produced? Uh, so a movie that I, I co-wrote, directed, and co-produced is a movie called Soda Springs. Uh, that I made with my friend Jay Pickett. And um, just the whole thing was an amazing experience. It's a contemporary Western. It's one of those movies where I can just have the camera on a tableau of like a, a truck pulling into a gas station and just cumulus clouds going by and this beautiful cobalt sky, and I don't have to move the camera. And there's just something really nice about that. But right. it's, it's a really beautiful story that we came up with. And we shot it in Idaho, which is Jay, oh, wow. uh, Jay Pickett's home state. And... Um, his friends Gary and Jamer and Jay, they financed the movie. So we all went to Idaho and just seeing the guys enjoying making the movie in Idaho, just the joy right. of people wanting us to be there. Is a, right. I, I, you know, there's an issue with LA. Shooting in LA can get somewhat frustrating right. because people really don't want you in their neighborhood shooting, right. even though they're in the business. But you go to somewhere like Idaho and it's like you're welcomed and they're excited. Yes. And, yeah. That's I mean, cool. we found this woman yeah. in sweet Idaho, population 85, with this beautiful farmhouse. It's this beautiful apple green farmhouse. I'm like, yeah. that's the house. And so we knocked on her door and we said, hi, we're, you know, we're making a movie and, you know, could, could we film at your place? She says, sure. I'm like, oh well, how much would you charge? Oh, I don't want to charge anything. What? Well, I just like having people around. I'm like, no, 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 no. We have to give you money. No, no, I don't want any money. We're like, no, we're going <laughs> to give you something. This would never happen in <laughs> no, LA. No, <laughs> it would never happen. And and we shot at her house for a week and a half. Oh my and, gosh! And it was a beautiful thing. And and we shot all over Idaho. It was it was it was great. So it was just a great and experience. You paid her. Uh, we did pay her some money, <laughs> yes. Not L.A. monies, but she was very happy and very appreciative. she was. <laughs> but she was happy to have us there. I think her husband had passed away not like one or two years earlier. And oh, my God. She was a little lonely, and and, and it was a nice thing for I her and for us. Story. You know, So when you go yeah. out of Los Angeles, yeah. that, that so this is something, too. It's, it's very easy to get tainted by the film world in L.A. Or, or New York or now Atlanta, Georgia. And and it's easy to, to lose what you really love about filmmaking. Right, right. So when you go out of the city, like I, sh I shoot movies in Hawaii sometimes. Yes. In Hawaii, they love yeah. the films, you know. Um, shooting on the streets in New York, actually, you can actually shoot on the streets in New York without a permit. Yes. As long as you're handheld or with a tripod. And there's a certain energy to that, yeah. too, that I love. So, you know, uh, it's nice to... So Soda Springs reminds me always of just the... Yes. Just what I, I love exactly about filmmaking. I know exactly what you're saying. Even as a filmmaker myself in documentary, when I've taken the documentary around the country, uh -huh. it's the areas like... Asheville, North Carolina, or mm -hmm. uh, Iowa, whatever, that they just are so excited for you to be there right. and so appreciative of the film. So I know right. what you and mean. And we're excited by yeah. it. Yeah, And we're in the business, but yes. but but yeah. in LA, the people get, get tainted by yeah. it. You know? <laughs> so I want to wrap up our conversation talking about getting more women into the uh, production arena because, you know, I hear it all the time. I'm actually on a, a board called uh, Take the Lead Women where uh, it's called 50 Women Can Change the World. And, and they are going in different verticals and I happen to be on the board for uh, the one that's about women in television and film. And they feel like there's not always opportunity, especially for directing and whatnot. But I know you said like you've had people on your set I think you said her name was Mar Mars Marcel. Marcel. It right. was a costume designer, and you yeah. actually encouraged her and said, "You know, you could write. You could." Direct, I encourage her all the time. You know, to be your yeah. assistant director. Yes, and, and I, um, I I demanded she be my assistant director, yeah, and, and, I love and that. she did it, and she did a good job. She did a good yeah. job. She still yeah. doesn't think she did a good job, but I yeah. think she did a good job. Yeah. Uh, she likes to stick with costume, yeah. but what I, would you tell? I know. I know you said you wish there were more women gaffers and lighting and stuff. I think they're out there. How would they how would they get into the business? What is your advice to them as a man in the business who is supportive of empowering women in the business? So so I've been thinking about this question a lot, knowing I'm coming on the show. But I bet you have. <laughs> <laughs> no I, mansplaining. <laughs> I, first of all, you can't wait for people to hire you. Okay? Yes. You can't wait. I, I can't wait. Studios don't hire me. I've made yeah. 63 movies. They yeah. think I make. It's a very odd right. world that I live in. So create your They'll, own. You have to create your own. You have right. to do it yourself. Um, 
I mean, Lena Dunham's a perfect example. She right. made a short film yes. and ended up being an HBO TV series. Yes. The thing that's empowering about movies is that you can make them for no budget and you can compete. Yeah. So if I wanted to start a car company, yes. okay, I'd have to be Elon Musk, get yeah. billions of dollars from private investors, the government, whatever, and then compete with the car company, yes. okay, to make a product that's equal to that. Yeah. But we in the, in the film, anybody in the film business, not just we, anybody yeah. in the film business can actually uh, uh, fabricate a film. I agree with you. You have to be, you have to want to be a storyteller. Yes. Now to make a movie, and this is, I think, where the, the, the difficult part for women, and it's a societal thing, I think, is um, we don't bring up our girls to be uh, uh, leaders, powerful, commanding, demanding, um, well, there are some. You know, there are a lot out there who are. Listen, but I one know of the culture, one of sure. I know what you're saying. We have to it's a, right. shift our culture to breed more confidence in women. Right. In fact, one of the if few women, one of the few women who have come to me and said, "I want to learn how you make movies." Yeah. And she said, I just want to work on your movie. So I gave her a job production coordinating. She said, can you drive me to set every day? And I drove with her to set where our set was about an hour outside of L.A. And we drove every day and she just asked me questions, questions, questions. And she's a director. She's directing television. She was also in the Israeli military. Okay. Wow. And uh, uh, her name's Zaki Rubenstein. And, uh, and she's amazing. She's a powerful woman. I actually learned how to direct the way I direct from a woman. Okay. I produced about seven, nine movies. I was with the company and they teamed me up with this with this woman who's a director and she's a badass. And I learned how to direct from her. She's actually the one. So, but what, I think- What that, was her name? Um, her name's Jennifer Marchese. Great. And- uh, We'll give and a shout out to her. I learned how to deal with actors and relate to actors from my wife watching her direct yeah. and choosing Matthias, um, the craft. But, so what I'm getting at is you don't have to wait to make movies. Right. You can make Create your own your movies. Fate, I call it. Yes, I mean, yeah. Steven Soderbergh has just released two films shot on iPhones. One's yeah. called Unsane, one's called uh, uh, High Flying Bird. And um, High Flying Bird, I think it is. And um, they're shot on iPhones. Yeah, okay. Black, yeah nothing uh, can stop you. A company called Black Magic just released a camera. It's called the 6K Pocket Cinema Camera for $2,500. That camera is basically just as good as the cameras they shoot the Avengers on. I'd love okay? that. And you can buy that camera for $2,500. You can take that camera and go shoot on the streets of New York. Go to Hawaii and shoot a movie. But at first, at the base, there's two things. You have to want to be a storyteller. And no, there's three, well, there's a lot of things. You have to want to be a storyteller. You have to know and understand the craft of the language of film and how to get what you want out of a crew. So you need to work, you need to make movies to learn how to make movies. Yeah, you know? and I think that's almost with anything in life. So it's yeah. no different for making a movie. You have to Great put the work in. advice. People can find you on uh, Instagram and Facebook. Yeah, yeah, Mike Pfeiffer Facebook. on Instagram, and then yeah. Facebook's Michael Pfeiffer. Okay, and, great. Uh, and IMDb, they can look up what I've done with Michael Pfeiffer. I love it. Well, keep making great movies, and we're so happy that you're doing what you love. Thanks. I'm a big believer, and everybody should be doing what their gift is and doing what they really love doing. And they can do it. Yeah. An iPhone, a camera, just take the camera and get your friends and go shoot. I love it. Good advice. Yeah. Okay. All right, go get the camera. Go thanks, out there everybody. and shoot this week. <laughs> All right, thanks for tuning in. We appreciate it. We'll see you next week. Take care. Hugs and happiness. Everything